We are now entering one of the greatest ages in the history of man, probably the most revolutionary age in the entire course of man's history, the exploration of the vast spaces around the earth in which man has lived ever since he was born. Until now, man has been confined to this little planet surrounded by an atmosphere 100 miles high. And in this respect, he has been like a fish at the bottom of a 100 mile deep ocean, unable to see what goes on above the surface. He could see the world only through two windows. One, the very small window of visible light, and the other, a small radio window. The atmosphere distorts the light and also prevents the penetration of most radio waves from outer space. As a result, man's vision of the outer universe is very limited. With the coming of the age of space, it has now become possible for man to rise above the confining atmosphere and to see the universe around him in its pristine glory without any hindrance. To understand how this has been made possible, we need to understand some basic laws of nature. Isaac Newton, one of the greatest intellects in the history of man has formulated these laws. One of them, of course, is the law of gravity, the law of universal attraction discovered by Newton, one of the greatest discoveries of all time. The others are Newton's three laws of motion. According to the law of gravitation, each body in the universe attracts all other bodies around it with a certain force. The greater the body, the greater the force. The sun attracts the earth, and the earth also attracts the sun, but on a much smaller scale. The earth attracts the moon, and the moon attracts the earth with a certain definite force. Weight, as we know it, on this earth, is entirely the result of the force of gravity. The greater the force of gravity, the greater the weight. Since the moon is much smaller than the earth, a given weight on the moon would be much smaller than the same weight on the earth. For example, a human being weighing 180 pounds on the surface of the earth would weigh only a sixth of 180, namely 30 pounds, on the surface of the moon, since the force of gravity on the moon is only one sixth the pull of gravity on the earth. On the other hand, on Jupiter, which has about two and a half times the Earth's gravitational pull, a man weighing 180 pounds would weigh something like 450 pounds. And the Sun, which has a pull 28 times the gravitational pull of the Earth, a man weighing 180 pounds would weigh about two and a half ton. On the other hand, the farther away a body is from another body, the less the gravitational pull. Therefore, a man weighing 180 pounds on the surface of the Earth will weigh less on a high mountain and would weigh less and less the higher he climbed. Gravity is the basic force that governs the movement of the satellites and the movements of all the stellar bodies, including those of the planets around the sun, of the moon around the earth, and of all the stars in their courses. All through the universe, as far as we know, the law of universal gravitation holds true. In addition, Newton has formulated the three great laws of motion. The first law of motion is that every body persists in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled by an external force to change that state. In other words, a body at rest remains at rest and it takes an external force to move it. This is, of course, common sense. What is not common sense is the second part of Newton's first law of motion, namely that a body in motion will continue in uniform motion in a straight line forever, unless there is an outside force to stop it. You have to remember the second part of this law to understand the movements of the planets around the sun, of the moon around the earth, and also of the movements of satellites around the Earth and of the artificial planets around the Sun. They all keep going around in space because there is nothing there to stop them. However, 
Unless a satellite is high enough, it would eventually be stopped by friction with the air in the upper atmosphere. Now, the second law is the law of acceleration. A force acting upon a body causes it to accelerate in the direction of the force, the acceleration being proportional to the force causing it. For example, if we push an automobile with a certain force, and at another time we push it twice as hard, it will have twice as much acceleration the second time as the first. Also, the lighter the body being pushed, the greater the acceleration caused by the same force. It is this second law of motion that is taken advantage of in sending up rockets in stages. Each succeeding stage being lighter, attaining a proportionally greater acceleration. Newton's third law of motion is that forces always occur in pairs, one force of each pair being equal and opposite to the other. As Newton formulated it, for every action or force, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It is this all-important Newton's third law of motion that operates in the propulsion of a jet airplane and in the launching of a rocket into space. Knowing the law of gravity and the three laws of motion, we shall have no difficulty in understanding how the planets move around the sun, how the moon moves around the earth, how satellites are launched, and how satellites continue going around and around without falling back to earth. Let us take the moon first. The moon goes around the earth with a speed of about 2300 miles per hour, 3350 feet per second. Now, the moon keeps falling down to earth by gravity at a rate of one nineteenth of an inch every second. But in that second, when the moon has gone forward 3,350 feet, the Earth's curvature has fallen away from the moon by one nineteenth of an inch, so that the distance between the moon and the Earth remains the same, namely about 239,000 miles. In other words, at a distance of 239,000 miles, the Earth's gravitational pull keeps pulling the Moon down one nineteenth of an inch every second. But in that same second of its fall, the Moon, obeying Newton's first law of motion, goes forward a distance of 3,350 feet. At that distance, the Earth has curved away from the Moon by exactly one nineteenth of an inch so that the Earth curves away from the Moon as fast as the Moon falls towards it, with the result that despite its constant falling, the Moon never gets any closer to the Earth. In other words, it is this constant falling of the Moon towards the Earth that prevents it from going off in space in a straight line, but keeps on going round and round the Earth. It would really be more correct to say that the moon is falling around the Earth. The same is true in the case of satellites. Now with satellites, there are two speeds that we must remember. One is known as the orbital velocity, and the other is known as escape velocity. Orbital velocity means that you must accelerate a rocket or a satellite to a speed of 18,000 miles per hour, five miles a second, to balance the gravitational pull of the Earth. So that if you send up a satellite with a speed of, let's say, 10,000 miles an hour, it will fall back to Earth because the force of gravity is greater than the force imparted to it by its motion. The same will be true with 15,000 miles an hour. But if you give it a push that accelerates you to 18,000 miles an hour, five miles a second, then the satellite will go up in proportion with the acceleration imparted to it. Let's say it is sent up to an altitude of 300 miles. At that distance, the force of gravity will pull it down 14 feet each second, 
but it will also keep going forward at a rate of five miles a second. And at that second, at that altitude, the Earth's curvature will have fallen away an equal distance, namely 14 feet. So, the satellite falls down 14 feet, and the Earth also falls down 14 feet through its curvature. So the distance between the Earth and the satellite will always remain the same, namely 300 miles. At higher altitude, it would fall down less, but also the curving away of the Earth would be less. In other words, the Earth will curve away from the satellite the same distance as the satellite falls towards it, so that the distance between them will always remain the same. Escape velocity, on the other hand, requires a velocity of seven miles per second, namely 25,000 miles an hour. When you accelerate a rocket to that speed, 25,000 miles an hour, it will escape the Earth's gravitational field altogether and will enter the gravitational field of the Sun, thus becoming an artificial planet. Now, actually, that's what has happened already. We have launched a large number of satellites to varying altitudes. Most of these were placed in orbit around the Earth because they were launched at speeds of 18,000 miles an hour. But there were so-called space probes that were launched at speeds of 25,000 miles an hour. These escaped the gravitational field of the Earth and entered the gravitational field of the Sun so that they are now revolving around the Sun as artificial planets. Since they are at a height of millions of miles from the Earth, there is nothing up there to stop them, so that they will continue revolving, or rather falling, round and round the Sun for all eternity, unless by a very remote possibility they happen to collide with a meteor. Now to go back a little bit in history. Rockets were known to the Chinese 700 years ago. They used them in celebrations, but did not understand the principle by which their rockets operated. Some 400 years later, in the 17th century, Newton explained this principle with his third law of motion, namely, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. By this principle, Rockets and jet planes operate. In the case of the rocket, you send out hot gases at a very high speed from a nozzle in the rear. And whatever the speed of the gases escaping in the rear, that will be the speed of the rocket going forward. The Chinese rockets operated this way, as did the rockets used by the British in their attack on Baltimore in 1814. These were the rockets immortalized by Francis Scott Key. He stood watching the rockets and wrote of the rocket's red glare in the Star Spangled Banner. Our Fourth of July celebration fireworks also operate according to Newton's third law of motion. In the case of jet planes, the same principle applies. In a jet plane, you use kerosene or petroleum, a hydrocarbon fuel, which is burned with oxygen from the air that the jet sucks in. This forms very hot gases, which are ejected at tremendous speeds through the nozzle in the rear. In the case of a jet plane, these gases come out with speeds of about 600 miles an hour or more, and therefore produce an opposite reaction, propelling the jet forward at the same speed. In the case of a rocket, the difference is that while a jet traveling in the atmosphere picks up its own oxygen from the air, a rocket has got to go beyond the atmosphere. Therefore, it has to carry its own oxygen. The hot gases come out from the bottom of the rocket at speeds of several thousand miles an hour, thus propelling the rocket forward at the same speed. Now the rocket and the fireworks that we used were very inefficient. It took the Second World War to produce a rocket on a practical scale. That was the V-2 rocket. The V-2 rocket used alcohol and liquid oxygen for fuel. It carried four tons of alcohol and five tons of liquid oxygen, 
a total of nine tons of fuel, which it burned in only one minute. The rest of its flight time, four minutes, it coasted along on its own momentum. The V-2 had a range of about 200 miles, and it was the forerunner of all our present so-called intercontinental ballistic missiles. The V-2 did not have enough speed to leave the atmosphere to overcome gravity because its top speed was only about 3,500 miles an hour. And as I have told you, to overcome gravity, to get in orbit, to balance the force of gravity, that is, you need a speed of 18,000 miles an hour. Now, how is this done? It is done in the so-called stage rocket. Instead of having to carry a big dead weight in space, you do it in three stages. Each stage has its own rocket engine and its own fuel supply. The first stage carries about 71% of the power and three quarters of the weight. It goes up 40 or more miles in two minutes at a speed of 4,000 miles an hour. In these first two minutes, the first stage has burned up all its fuel and by a timing mechanism, the used up shell of the first stage drops off, thereby greatly reducing the weight. Now here is where Newton's second law of motion comes in. That the lighter the body being pushed, the greater the acceleration imparted to it by the same force. So the second stage, greatly reduced in weight, has greater acceleration. The second stage attains a speed of 11,000 miles an hour and coasts onward up to an altitude of several hundred miles. The empty second stage drops off, and the third stage, carrying the last 2% of the power, impels the satellite into orbit at the required orbital speed of about 18,000 miles an hour. Being much lighter, the third stage still has enough energy to propel itself plus its payload, the satellite, at a speed of 7,000 miles an hour. When you add these 7,000 miles to the original 11,000 miles attained by the second stage, you have 18,000 miles an hour. And that, as we already know, is enough to balance the gravitational pull of the Earth and to place the satellite in orbit. When the built-in or ground controlled mechanism releases the empty shell of the third stage of the rocket, the shell also goes into orbit along with the satellite because by that time both the satellite and the shell of the third stage have speeds of 18,000 miles an hour, enough to balance the gravity pull of the Earth. The weight of a satellite depends on the power of the thrust of the rocket engine. The greater the thrust power, the greater the weight. Similarly, the height of a satellite's orbit depends on both the weight of the satellite and the thrust power of its rocket engine. The lighter the satellites, the greater the height attained by it by a given thrust. Now, here is where I again want to remind you of the second part of Newton's first law of motion, namely that a body in motion will persist in uniform motion in a straight line unless stopped by an outside force. If a satellite is launched in an orbit at 100 miles above the Earth, there would still be enough air up there to produce friction, namely resistance to motion, gradually to bring the satellite down to Earth because the friction, namely the air resistance, would in a relatively short time slow it down to the point where it would be going less than 18,000 miles an hour. When it reaches a low enough velocity, the pull of the Earth's gravity will no longer be balanced by the falling away of the curvature of the Earth, so that gravity will pull it down. A rocket orbiting at 100 or even 200 miles will not stay up very long. The higher it goes, the less atmospheric friction there will be, 
and the longer the satellite will remain in orbit. So that at about 500 miles, it can remain in orbit for probably several hundred years. Now for a little historical background. The age of space actually began in the year 1687, when Isaac Newton wrote a book called The System of the World. The book was written in Latin. Having discovered the law of gravity and having formulated the three laws of motion, Newton then worked out a system that explained the motions of the planets around the sun and of the moon around the earth. He also worked out a system for launching satellites around the Earth, and even figured out the actual speed, namely 18,000 miles an hour, or five miles a second, as necessary to launch a satellite into orbit around the Earth. The reason he couldn't go ahead and launch a satellite was because he didn't have the technology, the practical tools, the metals, the electronics, the instrumentation, that we have developed since Isaac Newton lived. So man had to wait something like 300 years before Newton's ideas could be carried out, the ideas that govern every step we take in the conquest of space. The real age of space, of course, began when the Russians launched the first satellite called Sputnik on October 4, 1957. We were a few months behind when we launched Explorer 1 on January 31, 1958. After that, we launched Vanguard 1 into an orbit ranging from 400 to 2,500 miles above the Earth. This is high enough so that it is expected to remain in orbit for at least 200 and possibly 1,000 years. By the spring of 1960, the Russians had launched four Sputniks and three space vehicles they call Lunix. Lunix 1 is a planetoid circling around the sun. Lunix 2 was the first object to land on the moon by the efforts of man. The third Lunix went around the moon, photographed the invisible far side of the moon, and then went for a while into orbit around the Earth. The next giant step into space will be to launch a manned space vehicle. In May 1960, a Russian Sputnik was launched weighing 10,000 pounds and carrying about 3,000 pounds of instruments. It carried a dummy spaceman. Meanwhile, we in the United States are training seven carefully picked flyers known as astronauts as part of the program known as Project Mercury. One of them, if not more than one, we hope, will be the first to be sent into orbit around the Earth, to get the first look at outer space, and to bring back knowledge hitherto unobtainable. A similar project, called Dinosaur, will utilize a modified Titan intercontinental ballistic missile to put an astronaut manned space vehicle into orbit. Since the launching of Vanguard 1, we in the United States have made great progress in methods and technology that have led to these men in space projects. This progress has included launching many satellites for specific purposes, such as space probes, when rockets with an escape velocity of seven miles a second free themselves from the gravitational pull of the Earth and reached millions of miles into space. These have been taken over by the gravitational pull of the sun and have become artificial planets. All of this is based on the discoveries and laws of the great Isaac Newton. For example, these planets are way up in space where the vacuum is so great that there are practically no atoms of air to interfere with them. Therefore, by the second part of Newton's first law of motion, Namely, that an object in motion will continue in motion unless stopped by an outside force. These artificial planets will continue in orbit around the sun forever since there is no outside force up there, no friction whatever, to stop them. Thus, 
Man at last has not only succeeded in launching artificial moons around his own planet, but he has also succeeded in adding artificial planets to our solar system. For the first time since the sun has come into existence, there is veritably something new under and around the sun. Now, what have man's artificial satellites, his moons around the Earth, and planetoids around the Sun accomplished? They have already accomplished a great deal. They have given us a lot of useful information about our environment that we didn't know before and couldn't have known before. They have also opened the promise for many useful applications that will make life much richer. Let's take first the immediate objectives gained. We have begun to launch satellites that will make possible much more accurate navigation. These are known as lighthouses in the sky, also as artificial stars by which to navigate. Transit 1B, the first lighthouse satellite sent up in orbit in April 1960, is the forerunner of a system of artificial stars which, because of their exactly plotted orbits, will enable navigators on the sea and in the air to use the satellites in plotting their own positions with much greater accuracy. We have also launched communication satellites. At present, long distance radio communication is dependent on the electrical mirror known as the ionosphere, a region of ionized or electrically charged air beginning about 65 miles above the surface of the Earth, which reflects shortwave radio signals of certain frequencies back to Earth and makes long distance radio transmission possible. This electrical mirror is subject to great fluctuations, mainly due to magnetic storms, but we have already begun to send up satellites to serve as artificial electrical mirrors, not subject to magnetic storms. These pioneer communication satellites have already been used to relay radio signals long distances into space, escaping the interference of the atmosphere. A series of such satellites will make possible a completely reliable system of radio communication on Earth by reflecting the radio signals through space from one point to another. A similar setup of satellites orbiting the Earth could provide for worldwide transmission of television signals, which are now limited to distances no farther than the horizon. Tyros-1, the weather satellite sent into orbit in April 1960, which is expected to orbit for decades, has relayed to Earth detailed pictures of the Earth and its cloud cover. Similar vehicles to be sent aloft to different locations above the atmosphere are expected to place the science of weather prediction for the first time on a solid basis and may lead the way ultimately to the control of weather. Satellites are also playing an important part in national defense. Such satellites will serve as eyes in disguise and will detect any potential enemy's preparations for a surprise attack and therefore will eliminate one of the greatest threats to the free world, namely the possibility of a super Pearl Harbor with intercontinental ballistic missiles that could travel across the ocean in about 15 minutes with hydrogen and atomic warheads. By eliminating the element of surprise, such satellites, such eyes in disguise, will really serve as great weapons for peace. Now these are the practical objectives. There are other objectives that are not of immediate practical use, but nevertheless are of tremendous importance to man. Already we have discovered with two satellites that the Earth is surrounded by great radiation belts, powerful electrical layers that surround the Earth. 
That would be of great importance when man gets ready to travel in space because he will need considerable shielding to protect him against that radiation. We also have established records of communication with outer space. One of the artificial planets orbiting around the sun, Pioneer 5, has reached a communication record between the Earth and space at a distance of 12 million miles, but that is only a beginning. We expect to reach more than 100 million, several hundred million miles in space. In addition to establishing a long distance communication record, Pioneer 5, the artificial planet, has made several other highly important discoveries. One of the most spectacular has been the discovery of the existence of an electric ring current circling the Earth at an altitude of 40,000 miles. The current system forms a giant ring of low energy electrically charged particles enclosing the Earth. The center of the ring is at a height of 40,000 miles and it covers a region extending from about 28,000 miles to 52,000 miles. The total current flowing in this region has been computed to be 5 million amperes. The newly discovered current is not to be confused with the two lower radiation belts known as the Van Allen belts discovered by earlier American satellites, which occur at altitude of 4,000 to 24,000 miles. Pioneer 5 has also made a detailed examination of the magnetic fields between the planets. It is expected that these pioneering observations of the interplanetary magnetic field will shed new light upon the physical nature of the solar system. Now, the extraterrestrial environment in outer space is so different from conditions on Earth that it would be as inimical to human life as the atmosphere is to a deep sea fish. For example, our atmosphere supplies us with oxygen without which life could not go on. There is no oxygen in space. The atmosphere exerts upon us a sufficient barometric pressure to maintain body fluids in the liquid state. At 63,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure equals the vapor pressure of body fluids at body temperature. At such a pressure, the body fluids, such as the blood, will both boil and evaporate. In the emptiness of space, there is no air for use in an artificially pressurized cabin. The atmosphere filters out the dangerous radiations, such as cosmic rays and ultraviolet rays. In space, no such protection exists. In the denser layers of the atmosphere, visible light is scattered by the air molecules, producing the beautiful blue shade of the sky, the so-called skylight. In interplanetary space, the density of air particles is too low for scattering effects, and with the absence of the blue sky, the stars are visible against a dark background at all times, even together with the bright sun. The atmosphere transmits sound waves. In space, there is no medium for sound propagation. Space is totally silent. The loss of sound wave transmission first affects the higher frequencies, and finally, in the higher altitudes, the lower frequencies also disappear. But at a point 100 miles above the Earth, the zone of complete silence is reached. Since weight, as we have seen, is a measure of the force of gravity acting on a body, and since a space vehicle stays up there by counterbalancing the force of gravity, it means that the space vehicle as well as its occupants, will be in a state of weightlessness, or zero gravity. In such a state, whales and elephants, mice and men, the fat lady of a circus, and the shapeliest of fashion models will have the same weight, namely zero. No one at present knows whether human beings could withstand long periods of weightlessness, either physiologically or psychologically. With a little shaggy dog, Laika, that lived for a week in orbit 
in Russia's second Sputnik indicated that the condition is not incompatible with life. These are some of the problems that space medicine, a new branch of medical science, must solve successfully to make it possible for man, the deep sea fish, to live outside his customary waters, the atmosphere. The ultimate purposes for which the American space program is striving are, first, the study of the earth and the sun in order to understand how the sun controls our planet. Second, to learn the nature of the solar system and the universe. Third, to search for the origin of life and its likely presence outside the earth. As Dr. Van Herr von Braun, one of the world's greatest space scientists has put it, quote, our sun is one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. Our galaxy is one of billions of galaxies populating the universe. It would be the height of presumption to think that we are the only living things in that enormous immensity." Close quote. These ultimate purposes are, of course, the long-range aims. The more immediate goals for the next 10 years pursued in the program of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, are the following. The first suborbital astronaut flight. 1961, manned orbital flight and landing of a scientific payload on the moon. 1962, the first space probe measurements in the vicinity of Venus and or Mars. 1963, 1964, a controlled landing on the moon and an orbiting astronomical and radio astronomy observatory. 1964, unmanned circumnavigation of the moon and return to Earth. Unmanned reconnaissance of Mars and Venus. First launching of a three-stage Saturn rocket, the largest space transportation system now in active development. 1965 through 1967, initial phases of a program leading to manned flight around the moon and the establishment of a permanent space station. Beyond 1970, manned flight to the moon and back. What do we expect to learn from such a breathtaking program? There are in store for us answers to fundamental questions about man and his universe. These are questions man has been asking ever since he began to wonder ever since he learned to think. He wants to know how the universe began and whether or not the universe ever had a beginning. He wants to know whether or not the laws governing the universe in his immediate vicinity, the universe he can observe, also holds true in the rest of the universe. Man also wants to know whether the laws governing his universe today were the same a billion years ago or whether they have been changing and will continue to change. Man also seeks answers to questions equally fundamental, but even more intimate to himself and his universe. These are questions about life itself, about its origin, about its meaning, about its future, its possible ending, about its mechanism. Above all, he wants to know whether life as it exists on Earth is the only form of life that can possibly exist or whether other forms exist that may be even superior to our own. The depths of space hold the answers to these questions. In man's ability to escape the gravitational bonds that have held him to Earth, to reach into the depths of space, in this ability lies the opportunity for him to answer these age-old fundamental questions. Exploration of the planets around us and the space beyond will not only give us knowledge gained through answers to these questions, it may also give us a better understanding of how to utilize this knowledge for our own spiritual, intellectual, and physical advancement. 
This knowledge is not something for the far off distant future. We may expect answers to begin coming in in the lifetime of most human beings living today. We may expect answers to begin trickling in, maybe around five years from now. In 10 years, we shall have increased our knowledge of our world to a tremendous extent, an extent that might have taken us hundreds of years of groping in the darkness of our atmosphere that hides all this knowledge from us. Another of the most enticing promises that the conquest of outer space holds out for us is the possibility of getting into communication with living beings and other civilizations in other worlds. This is a possibility that until recently has been pure speculation. But now we are beginning to have the promise and the means by which we may attain this possibility. The more we learn about the universe, the more we realize that life is not necessarily unique on this little planet of ours. There are other planets, other solar systems, possibly millions of them at great distances from us on which life similar to ours could exist and where civilizations not only equal to ours but also perhaps superior to ours could exist. There are, for example, two suns similar to ours in our cosmic neighborhood. One is called Tau Ceti and the other is Epsilon Eridani. They are only 11 light years away from us. They have the same properties as our sun, the same age, the same size, and therefore it is hoped that they may have planets similar to ours on which civilizations have arisen. Now in Green Bank, West Virginia, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, astronomers are working on a project aiming to determine whether such inhabited planets exist. They have very sensitive, delicate radio receiving instruments and are working in the hope of tuning in and hearing signals that may be sent to us from planets of these two neighboring suns. Their work is greatly hampered by radio interference created by the Earth's atmosphere. But within the decade, we expect to establish space platforms upon which to set up an observatory with all kinds of instruments, radio astronomy instruments, as well as optical telescopes that will be there on a permanent basis and will continually observe space around us without a distortion of the atmosphere and keep sending us knowledge of what is taking place in the outer universe. From such a platform, beyond the interference of our atmosphere, sooner or later, maybe before another decade or two pass, we may get a tremendous thrill of being told that a message from outer space has come true, that man has at last established communication with life and civilizations in other worlds. You can imagine what it would be, what would happen if, for instance, a signal comes true and it turns out that there is a civilization on one of these suns in one of these solar systems, which is, let's say, a thousand or five thousand years ahead of us. We could ask them, how did you find a cure for cancer? How did you learn to postpone the coming of old age? How did you learn to maintain youth for decades longer or even for eternity? How did you ever learn to live in peace with your neighbors? And similar questions that may take us hundreds, perhaps thousands of years to answer for ourselves. It would mean that in a very short time, we could take a giant leap into the future, thousands of years ahead. Now all this knowledge will enrich us so much intellectually and spiritually that man himself on this earth will really become a different being. Man is born with creative talents that until now have had very little chance to develop to their full potential. There is practically no human being, if he is normal physically and mentally, who does not have some specific creative ability. This new age of space will enrich man to such an extent that he will have greater vision, 
greater understanding and therefore will be a superior human being to what he has been. Hence it may be said that in addition to reaching out to other planets by actual space travel, and in addition to becoming enriched by much new knowledge about the universe around us, this planet of ours will in itself be changed to an extent that to all intents and purposes it will be as though we had left our planet and reached a far off planet in outer space in which life is infinitely richer than it had ever been on this earth. We might therefore say that on the strength, on the wings of the new knowledge that outer space will give us, man shall be able to roam intellectually and spiritually throughout his universe as though he had become an entirely new being and died with the ability to travel at will throughout space and to master its secrets. We are now therefore entering an age of which until recently even the most imaginative of dreamers has not even dared to speculate. The question is, will man be prepared for it? It is essential that man be prepared to adapt himself to this new world in which he is now about to enter. Unless he does so prepare himself, he will not only be in danger of not getting all the advantages that this new world would offer him, there is also great danger that the knowledge he will get will be misused, just as a great deal of the knowledge man has found in the past has been misused for destructive purposes. Man's very survival may depend on his becoming aware that he is standing at the gates of a new world in which the great creative forces, intellectual and spiritual, dormant within him, may at last reach fulfillment. By such awareness, he will take the first important step towards the transformation of this earth into the planet of his dreams. <laughs>